Welcome back to part two of my chat with Rob Carlton on I Catch Killers. Rob, I don't know where to take this second part. Yep. What are we get? What are we going to talk about? How many times have you been killed on TV? Oh, mate. Well, I I started not. I didn't start a, a lot of times. Shot and killed yeah. on Australian TV and and shows around the world a, a lot of times. It started early. <laughs> I didn't start by getting shot, but I started by being a malevolent presence on a country practice. A kid that may have been up to no good and that may put a, a, a young woman in danger. I then went a little later on on a country practice. They removed my testicles uh, and sent oh, them to <laughs> Burrigan for testing. I got thrown out of Summer Bay by Alf again for sort of intimidating a young girl down on the beach. I got called a, a flaming mongrel by, <laughs> by, Alf, by Alf. Which I take as... A, high, high point. Oh, mate, yeah. every, every Australian yeah. wants, Who wants would to want do to that. that. Absolutely. Yeah. So then I started graduating. Um, I got thrown out of East Street by the Reverend Bob. Um, again, for intimidating. I think I bashed an old man uh, on that occasion. And I thought Reverend Bob, being a Christian, should have been kinder to my character. But no, he got rid of me and yeah. the audience clapped. Uh, I think then I went on to McLeod's Daughters and got trampled by both women and horses. Again, for being a bit of an asshole towards women. Uh, on Water Rats, I just got shot dead. Uh, and what after, had you done wrong this time? Pardon me? What had you done wrong this time? Oh, I tried to kill and shoot and maim everyone. I was chasing Colin Friel's character all about the place. I played a great <laughs> character called Kiwi Dave. Anyway, they shot me dead. And when I died, no one mourned me. They stood over my body and said, he needed shooting. I was invited on to All Saints where I played a bank robber. Where I crashed myself in a car and then had to have open heart surgery, saved by Dr. Luke Falano on the side of the road. They invited me back to All Saints where they smashed my head open uh, because I was, again, some sort of violent side, side person at a pub. They invited me onto Blue Healers where I blew myself up. Um, <laughs> look, the judge had made a bad call. I was upset with it. And so to make my point, I uh, strapped my body with explosives and, 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 and held the court hostage uh on raw against the late great heath ledger i was trying to kill him but they got me first uh, i got shot through the heart with an arrow uh on that one so i'm no stranger gary uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here i am thinking uh, a little bit naive you'll, ma- you've seen the world absolutely when i played kerry packer on the second season i died but then came back to life <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's right. With yeah. the pack of whackers. It was the only, that was the only resurrection story I faced. <laughs> uh, generally I get shot and killed. Uh, oh, and, and these days, if Australia needs a racist, um, uh, a racist, either murderer or just a nasty racist person, I'm the go-to guy. Um, Rob, uh, you're, you're disappointing me. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I've got one of those faces that people, or audiences love to hate if, if they... If, if sex the symbol? Have you Sorry? A sex symbol. Mate, a sex symbol. I, love I, Mate, I got invited onto Underbelly, and yeah. they didn't ask me to take my shirt off. Now, if, <laughs> if you're... Like, I, if you're going to get asked to get nude on anything, it's underbelly. But they said, Rob, our audience won't be able to handle that, man. You're going to have to st- keep your clothes on. In fact, here, have a jacket too. <laughs> this, this is unfair. I remember when you were on the set, I remember getting a phone call from you yep. one night on on the set of uh, Underbelly. Yep. And I think you were down filming down near Harry Cafe de Wills or oh, whatever, okay. down, down that way. Yep, yep. And you asked me, I'm a crop cop, I'm on the set. I just need some, uh, need some, uh, yeah, thoughts on what. I don't know why you phoned me too. We'll clar- yeah, clarify yeah, yeah, that. That's right. That's right. This is before any charges or allegations were made. I against know, me. but I said at the beginning of this chat that I could it. see things coming. Right, cracks in the armor. Oh, it's when I discovered that you were a heinous criminal, capable of such horrible things as recording all of those phone calls. <laughs> I thought to myself, "Yep, that's the Gary I know." Yeah, and I haven't learnt. Here I am in the studio <laughs> Here with we are. cameras and recorders everywhere. <laughs> But uh, the the question you had, and mm. this is uh, this is what I like about the creative types, the artists that you are, that you look, or, or the one that you are in particular, the the subtlety of what's going on, because yeah. basically the scene required you to go in, as was the old ways in policing, seventies, eighties, or whatever. Yeah. Go, oh, here's a free coffee, here's a yeah. free meal, or, yeah. or whatever. What do, Jubes, what do you do? Do I get my handcuffs out or do I, I show my police badge or point to my gun or yeah. whatever? How do I ask for a free meal at a cafe? Yeah. What would the go be? Mm. And I always, uh, what I saw was the older school that would go get the free meals or whatever. Mm. They'd go in and the owner would be saying, um, what do you want? 
Oh, just the usual, or we'll leave it up to you. That was almost like a subtle, mm. subtle code. You're not mm. saying, here, we're in the cops, we want a free meal. Mm. It was almost like, oh, whatever you want to give us. And uh, I don't know, that was a way of so- softening it. But you were looking for that type of detail in the character. Absolutely. So the human being has the most extraordinary capacity to see what's going on, right? We are social animals that require an understanding of the way we do things around here in order to stay alive. And there are so many different ways and practices and types. There's in-groups and out-groups. So evolutionarily speaking, if you don't know the way to behave around here, you're going to be an outcast super quick, right? Or if you don't know what those guys over there are doing, then you're going to be their slave, very quickly Mm. because they're going to be doing things that they're going to try and keep you out of. And so unless you've got your eyes and ears open, there's so many things going on around you all the time that can trip you up, that can leave you behind. But if you're awake to it, then you can either avoid the danger or if you're that sort of person, you can profit off the situation. Now, my interest as an actor always is to get a sense of what's going on and how is it done in the most subtle of fashions. And this is the beauty of making TV and film, is that you can get a close-up of a tiny little thing that most people wouldn't see in the daily world. But because you have the power of editing, you can get a close-up of that subtle thing where the officer may just slightly shift the jacket back to reveal just the butt of the, just the tiniest yeah. tip of the gun. Just a tiny it's little subtle. thing. Loads of those, those dialogue things that you just said. Just the usual. Leave it up to you. Yeah. Leave it up to you. Doesn't that sound like the most generous of offers? <laughs> and, Does, and the most sinister uh, undertow. Uh, yeah. When you put it that way and in that tone, it, yeah. it sort of, well, I can't, I said leave it up to them. Mate, you know, nothing sinister yeah, going on here. I just offered an opportunity for him to. But you you were, you were playing a real live cop in that. It was yeah. Going, but that wasn't uh, the first phone call I made to you about that character. No, uh, but and, and you were talking about, and this is what uh, you got. What the character was mm. like. I I didn't know him. I knew of him. I knew his type. The one yeah. that gets caught up in. That's uh, right. Corruption. Neville Scully Scullion was the yeah. character. Yeah, and I'm it's. Really. You, you, I, I think our discussions were, do you think he was leading it or do you think, and I, I said, I, I thought he was just weak. I, I thought it was a weak human being mm. that was sort of following the, in mm. the pack. And as you said, human beings wanting to be belong. Yeah. And, uh, he well, he was a part. great fun character to play. And again, he wasn't a lead character, yeah. um, but he was a really, really important part of that story because he was a man that could have been a great detective or a corrupt detective, depending on the cultural leadership inside that environment. Yeah. And to me, that represents the vast bulk of the human experience. We can all be good and we can all be bad, depending on the culture in which we find ourselves. There's not that many people that will swim against the tide. And so I really, really enjoyed playing Scullion because, look, in the end, we know from the historical record that he was a bit corrupt, mm. but he wasn't a leader of it. He was just in those moments trying to serve the masters around him. So the reason I loved playing that was what are the sorts of things that a guy like that, he could be good, he could be kind, yeah. he did have compassion, but he also let the f- public down. He took money. He did these things. And so I'm always really interested in those tiny little uh, interpersonal moments where that person could make the choice to go either way, but they don't. Mm. And that's, I think, what's really interesting for a viewer because then they're not sitting there. If, if the guy's clearly corrupt and a bit of an ass, then there's no jeopardy there. There's nothing interesting because you know what they're going to do in any given moment. Yeah. But if they could go either way, that's when it becomes compelling. And I believe we live our lives like that. We truly believe as we go along that we're making decisions. I could be this or I could be that. And that's why we tell our stories. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it was an interesting take. And, and to me, again, it showed that you do get, you understand that that's not a world that you're, you operated in. No. But you understood the subtleties of it. And that well, those, I understand those... that coercive pressure, yeah. that wanting to be liked by those around you. And I think that speaks to everybody, no matter what walk of uh, life you're from, whether you're from the criminal class, whether you're from the working class, the upper class, the intelligentsia, the literati, the creatives, there is a sense of, am I going to be liked by saying this or not liked? Liked by doing, not liked. Am I going to get ahead Hmm. by by serving myself, by being a bit sneaky? 
you know. And so there's all those things I, I love when it comes to playing these complex characters. Well, speaking of playing complex complex characters, yeah. Kerry Packer. Mm. Now, when you played Kerry Packer, yep. it was yeah. I'm not uh, yeah a movie critic or TV critic, but it was an outstanding performance. Thank you. Um, and you got a Logie for it, which is uh, a good recognition Thank for you. for what you did there. The way because Kerry Packer was so well known, yeah, that would make it difficult playing that person because people know his mannerisms, know the. Oh, mate, it was terrifying, it. and and it, it it made it very difficult for me. Nearly, uh, I, I nearly ruined the whole thing before I even got the job without even knowing it. How? I had no idea. Well, I've been. It's a bizarre thing, right? I was really busy at the time. I get a, an invitation to audition for Kerry Packer, yep. which was a big invitation because it was the lead role in a drama. And the reason I'd done that was because over the last few years, I'd created my own show and I'd shown myself to be a showrunner and a, and a lead actor in, 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 that I could handle the pressure. Yep. So, but I then get this thing. To cut a long story short, for the first few weeks, I'm dodging it. I'm going, I'm too busy. We'll send the scripts. Oh, the scripts aren't that great at the moment. Let me meet the director. Oh, I've met the director. She was interesting, but I've got to go to America and I'm busy. And no, I don't have time to do an audition right now. I'll do it when I come back. Doing all this. Now, part of me was thinking, what would Kerry do? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But I was standing in a hotel room in Los Angeles. I received an email from the producer saying, Rob, the pressure is real. We do need to see an audition from you before you come back from LA. So we just need to know whether you're in or you're out. Yeah. And Gary, I swear, I read that email and all of a sudden I felt sick to my core because I realized I was terrified of getting the role. And then I went back through in my mind for the two weeks leading up to that, oh, he'd do that, pushing it away, me trying to be all cavalier, me taking control of the situation, me telling them when I'd be ready. I thought that was courage and taking control. Yeah. But it was fear masquerading as courage. I was doing, my subconscious was doing everything to trash that opportunity. <laughs> right. right. That's interesting. But I'm standing in the hotel room and I realise that it's been fear this last couple of weeks. So I'm ashamed of myself. Yeah. And then I go, oh my God. And why was I fearful? Because you're right. For the first time ever, I was going to play a role. I was going to have the opportunity to play a role where everyone knew what he looked like, knew what he sounded like, and they thought they had an opinion on what he was like. So people would be able to look at my performance and look at it and, and compare it to the yeah. real thing and, and go, to... you're shit at acting. <laughs> yeah. And the idea of getting caught out being shit at what you think you do at the age of 40 oh, is terrifying. terrifying. The flicker on that is that I'd had these successes in the lead up to it. I'd won Tropfest. I'd created my own show. I'd sold it around the world. You would think, wouldn't you, that these other successes would make it easier to grab the next one. You would think. It made it harder because all of a sudden I had a vanity to protect. I had built a pride around my sense of self that I was going to put on the line and, and risk being looking like a tool. So that's where that fear came in and said, no, no, Rob, don't do it. Don't do it. Just, okay. You're too big. So all of this is going on in my head in this goddamn hotel room in Los Angeles. And I'm freaking out. And I'm thinking, that's cool. No one knows. I am really busy. I'll just say I can't do it. Right? <laughs> you, I did. You coward. Right? You're full coward. Yeah. And I'm sitting there. And then here's the thing that forced my hand. Adam Spencer, who uh, for Sydney viewers, um, or Triple J viewers from back yeah. in the day at 702, fruity, extraordinary guy, great mate of mine at university. We made a promise to each other back at university. So this, had, this was now 20 years earlier. Say yes to something that frightens the shit out of you at least once a year. We'd made that promise to each other 20 years ago because we thought, come on, come on. It was like, how are we going to keep this? Because we grew up, we were young and it was exciting. There was bright people around. We went to university um, with the Chaser guys. They were off there doing their thing and they were super exciting and fun and there was uh, and brilliant women and great thinkers and, and Spence and I kind of doing our thing in the debating and improv and comedy world. But we challenged each other. How are we going to keep this shit going, man? Because people turn stale. Yeah. And it was like, okay, well, let's try this. We'll try and say... Do something that frightens the shit out of us. It was that I remembered in the hotel room 20 years later. And I thought, oh, fuck, I'm fucked. <laughs> I've now got to. I'm fearful. And because as you get older, it's harder to find things that frighten you. Do you find that? 
Yeah, yeah. More, oh, I survived this, you survived that. So to to get that fear, you've got to take a bigger step each time. That's so tell me that. when you jumped out of the force hmm. and start, okay, let's go to the, what I know to be one of the biggest fears then. Let's yeah. jump over to the fear that you faced doing the stage show with me. Oh, yes. Okay. Let's be honest about that. Yeah. With your, let's talk about what I like to talk about when we talk about being frightened. Talk about your body. How did your body feel? Ah, oh, I and just to put it in perspective, when we did the live show, it had been put off because of COVID for a few yep. times, and it was always it got put off twice, and I was nervous about that. I wasn't going to do the live show. Then they dangled Rob Carlton do it with me, and I thought, oh well, you'll you'll hold my hand, and I thought it would be a sit down sort of. That's right. Chat. That's right. When it first was pitched, and it was I, a Q&A, wasn't it? I, and I, I think in Rob's terms, no, stupid, this is a theatre. We're going to take the audience on a journey. Yeah, mate. Which sounded good in theory. Yeah. And you had me whipped up. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And we did a lot of prep for it. Yeah. But then it got cancelled because of COVID yeah. lockdown and that. A, a couple of times I'm thinking, oh, well, as you just described your Kerry Packer thing, yeah. I'm thinking this is a soft way out. I wasn't scared of doing it. It was just that COVID, we couldn't do it, and now yeah, we can't reschedule. Okay. So I was, I, I was hoping in the back of my mind yeah. that it wouldn't happen because I know the pressure that I put myself through before I walk out on stage in an environment right. like that. And quite frankly, I was shitting myself. Yeah. Um, when we were in the uh, Enmore Theatre, Enmore Theatre on a Saturday night, and because it's my local area, that's that's icon stuff. Yeah, like, mate. Oh, you, growing up in Sydney, Enmore's yeah, iconic. It, it, and so what am I doing here? It's a Saturday night. Mm. And uh, I remember we had the change rooms. I had the bigger change room. You did. Out. You yeah. did. Which, again. <laughs> oh, they're called dressing rooms, actually. I call them change rooms. Yeah, that's right. Because you're a boxer. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, I had the bigger dressing room, but let's not be cranky about that. Yeah. But I'm hearing you making all these noises next door. <laughs> uh, what, what, what were you doing? Oh, oh uh, like... uh, it would have been ba 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 ka 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 right through the alphabet. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, and we've got uh, our uh, our good friend Nick, our yep. uh, my manager there, yep. going, oh, "Good luck." And I've said Nick, and this is Nick Fordham. Nick, you said it'll be fine. He's gone, yeah, I'm just not sure if we've gone too far. How this, hilarious this, is Nick, this, mate? This is, Nick goes, because at the beginning, I mean, Nick is an extraordinary yeah. man and I really enjoy his company. But he does, when he's pitching these ideas, it's bulletproof and there isn't doubt in his mind at all. It's like, yeah, this will be fine. This will, On the night of the thing, it's like, oh, good luck, fellas. Jesus, this is you're stepping, <laughs> stepping in the deep end here. So I'm listening to you go boop, boop, bop or whatever. Yep. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? What am I going to do? I had to get rid of the adrenaline in my body and yep. I, I started shadow boxing that's the only thing I, I, I knew what to do and mm. then yeah uh, full credit to you 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 gave some good advice went out there and uh, we were really pleased with it mm. oh look mate and again <clears throat> so what I saw mm. you do when you were faced with that fear yeah. that existential fear around here I am in a new space everyone knows me as the detective yeah and now I've got to be a performer yeah. And a live performer. So, you, you know, you'd been doing that podcast, but this yeah, is now. And, and remember, energy. and for the listeners that didn't see the show, um, I tasked Gary with performance speeches. So he was performing. There was, it was, he was taking on that role and that character. Now he was playing himself, but he had to learn speeches. He had to learn character dialogue. And, made, and, and what you did there was work, work your your, your oh, chops yeah, off yeah. to get it done. Yeah. And so that's exactly how I um, manage that anxiety yeah. and manage that worry is it's like, okay, I hold two things dear, all right? One, I'm constantly imagining the audience that's bought a ticket. Yeah. And so for our show, the mm. I Catch Killer stage show, at the top of my mind the whole time was these people are buying tickets. They're not cheap. Yeah. Right. And if we turn up and do a and a that's just not good enough. Yeah. So we've got to delight. Now, we've also got to surprise ourselves and keep it interesting for ourselves. So you just work really, really hard at figuring out how to do that. Yeah. So when I came to playing Kerry Packer, I'm standing in that hotel room and I think I've now got to try and commit to do it mm. because of this promise I made. And this is an interesting thing where long-term friendships really help drive you towards being trying to be better at stuff because if i if it was just me that would make i would have lied to myself and nipped off to you know yeah but um, the, the friends are pushing you along but it was that sense of well i'm going to let down adam spencer here 
Um, mm. So then with regards to then getting ready for that character, I then did everything I could to get the role. And then I was still nervous that the nerves didn't yeah. go away until they yelled cut on the final shot. Uh, but up until that point, I then just did absolutely everything I could to learn everything about that fella. Well, you you ab- absolutely uh, smashed the role, and I, I'm so proud of you the way the, what you did. The only drawback on it was I would say that's my mate Rob Carlton. We trained together, and you were were you wearing a fat suit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> like I put on 18 kilos. Yeah, and they and I'm going. Yeah, we've trained really hard, me and Rob, and they're looking at Kerry Packer sitting there. <laughs> uh, that's right. So I put on 18 kilos and I had to wear the fat suit. Yeah. Um, but then I took that 18 kilos off pretty quickly after that. Yeah, yeah. When, when I trained with you and then you were blasting my pecs out. <laughs> but running those hills. Could you buy a place higher up a hill? Mm. Oh, let's just, mm. oh, that, then we had a couple of uh, weird experiences when you discovered, what was it? Your, uh, your ropes from the... TRX straps. <laughs> TRX straps. Yeah, mate. Rob yeah. Uh, came back from LA going, ah, oh, I've got this new stuff. It's, you should try it. And I think your wife come home and uh, there you've got a strange man in, in the garage <laughs> <laughs> tied up. But anyway. It uh, was difficult to pass that one off. Yeah. It looked, Especially because you were so sweaty at the time. <laughs> it looked uh, looked strange at, strange at the time. Um, playing the bad guys. Yeah. Um, our, our good friend, Matt Nable, uh, I've spoken to him about different roles he's, he's played mm. and he says it takes a lot out of him sometimes playing the bad person Yeah, because you, you've got to get in that character. Yeah. You've got to think like that. Yeah. Talk us through some characters that you've played because you've played some pretty despicable characters. Yeah, I have. Um, and I've got a different take on it, yep. um, than Matty Nable. Yep. Um, and, uh, no one way gets better results or worse results, but. As Matt expressed to you, yeah. one way costs you more. Yeah. Um, and and that's, that's you know, Matty lives his life, as you know, full throttle. Um, he's an extraordinary creative artist, yeah. Matt Nable. Um, I first saw, was it the last winter, the first film that he made? Yeah. Um, and he was touting that around the Screen Producers Conference up there years ago, and I just got my deal up um, and he was still chasing a deal. So at that point, no one knew, knew Matt Nable. I was chatting him on the edges and, you know, looking like he looks tough rugby league guy and he wasn't getting much sway uh, from the people up there, from the sort of mm. the film types. And I, he showed me his film. I couldn't believe it. I thought it was the most incredible thing I'd seen. I rang him, I said, dude, whatever you're doing, just you just keep doing it. So, so Matt Nable is an extraordinary performer. His output is amazing and his insights are, are, are terrific. Yeah. But I think living, uh, acting that way can cost you yeah. and it can cost you emotionally. So I, I tend not to get too down. Now, playing Kerry Packer was an interesting thing because he's so different to me. Yeah. I got a phone call, really interesting phone call from Dana Reed, the director, after the first couple of days of shooting. She said, Rob, it's really interesting. Um, we'll get in the first part of the scenes working really well, um, and you're right there. But then if we have to stop and turn the lights around, right, so there's a bit of a break, then you just break into Rob and chat to the crew and do what you normally do, which is what I've done all my life. Yeah. You know, you're, you're jumping in, you're playing a character, then you're having a laugh with the crew. Hop, we're back on. She said, it takes you then about a take and a half to get back into Kerry Packer. That's interesting. Right. It takes, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, oh, wow. She said, I think it's because you're such different men. She said, once you're there, it's spot on. She said, but Rob, we don't have the time or the budget, right, the schedule to allow you that extra one and a half takes. Yeah. Right. It's Australian TV, man. You're shooting two minis, two, two one and a half hour shows in six weeks. Super tight. So she said, I'm going to, she said, I hate to do this to you. And it's going to sound all wanky, but when you come in in the morning and you put the fat suit on, can I ask you to try and stay in character? And this is the first time I'd ever done this. Try and yeah. stay in character while you've got the fat suit on, right? So it's the first time ever I'd done this and it helped enormously. So I would now, but what I had to do was as soon as I arrived that next day, I go and speak to all the crew members and say, Hey, listen, this is going to be a bit weird today. During takes, I'm not going to talk to you. All right. I'm just going to sit over there in the thing. I just need you to know that. So you don't think I'm a fuckwit. Yeah. Right. And then all my guests, the guest cast that would come in. Right. So I believe in, um, transparency and everyone understanding what's going on. I don't need for everyone to feel great or comfortable, but I need for everyone to know the deal. 
So when guest cast arrived, I would say to them, hey, I'd have breakfast with them and welcome and it's lovely to see you and can't wait to shoot today. Just so you know, I'm about to go and put the fat suit on uh, and when I do, I won't be looking at you. I won't be talking to you. I'll just be sitting over in the corner. Mm. Because what I had to do when I put that fat suit on was go and sit in the corner and before every time I heard the words action, I had to sit quietly and be inside myself and repeat this mantra to myself. My name is Kerry Francis Bullmore Packer and I appear reluctantly. Because these are the words that Kerry uh, Francis Bullmore Packer said when he was asked to uh, name himself and the capacity with which he appeared in front of the print media inquiry. And it was that famous day where he told them to go and get jump and he's not going to give them a dollar more in tax. But right at the very beginning, and this was part of my research, I saw a man surrounded by politicians, surrounded by the media, and they asked him to state his name and the capacity in which he appeared, and he said that. And to me, it was the epitome of that man. He was a lonely man. He knew his name. He knew what he was. He was Kerry Francis Bullmore Packer. But he did appear reluctantly. And I think he appeared in life reluctantly. Yeah. I, think he had a, I think he had a really uneasy relationship with himself and his family and, his, and, and the country in which he lived. Uh, and so that's what I needed to get to and hold that space. And so for the first time ever in my life, I couldn't jump in and out of that. But let me tell you, as soon as I took that fat suit off at the end of the day, I didn't think about that fucker for another minute really until um, I got back in that fat suit. Oh, no, sorry. I didn't stop thinking about him, mm. but there was no emotional impact on me. Right. I, don't, I am not of the school of thought that I have to be in an emotional state and as emotionally crippled as the characters I'm playing to perform that. My job is to recreate behaviour. Okay. You know, yeah. and different you can't do that method. It, so, yeah, sorry? Different ways of approaching it. Yeah. But it's interesting. It's fascinating. And I, and I, I see that the more I, I, I get to meet actors or whatever yeah. and the different ways they prepare and yeah. then can transfer yeah. themselves. I mean, that particular one was super fun because yeah. you're then looking at this guy that everyone sees as a monster and a titan of business. Yeah. And all I'm seeing is a 15-year-old boy. <laughs> so that's right? A... All I'm seeing is a 15-year-old boy hiding in the body of a monster, trying to fucking make sense of the world around it. That's such an interesting uh, assessment. And the but that's assessment what I see when I see you, Gary. Okay. When, I, when I hang out with you, the world sees you as a, a hardened, tough, and I see that yeah. too, don't get me wrong, yeah. I've seen that and I've witnessed that in you. Yeah. But what I connect with is this joyful, playful, loving kind, light-hearted, but serious person, all wrapped up in this wondrous kind of, I don't see a, a, a man that's got these connections and this history and a dark past and a sad past and a yeah. turbulent past. Like I think of your, mate, I do, I think of your professional career and it breaks my heart, mate. Mm. Oh, thank uh, It breaks yeah. my heart yeah. to see what you've been through. And yet, through this curious mix of resilience and joy and optimism and wonder, you still manage to float through life and bring so much <laughs> joy to me and make me laugh so hard. We, yeah, no, we, we've had, we have some you good know? times. And it's the, mix of, yeah. it's the mix of child and adult yeah. and drawing those strings together that brings such joy to me to be an actor. What, what about when we were working on a, uh, a project, not the live show, but we we're looking at the script and, yep. and, and working on something, the fun that we had with the uh, the whiteboards uh -huh. and the shit that we used to talk, that mm, used to mm. crack, crack, mm. Me, crack me up. We'd spend, like, we're working on a show and we've still got, uh, got plans on different things, but working through a script and ideas and all that. Yep. That was so much fun, wasn't oh, it? Right. Well, and we worked, we worked so hard. Yeah. We were just so energised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and hours, hours would go by in minutes. Yeah. Um, and because, again, I mean, the raw material uh, that you were able to bring to those conversations, um, as well as, again, again, for the people that saw the stage show, the wonderfully self-deprecating way in which you can, you know, honour your own craziness and, <laughs> and, you know, being all at sea and this wonderful mix of being completely in control and completely out of control all at once. Yes. Um, it was really, they were really, really fun times. 
Yeah. What about uh, Shandon Pitches? Yeah. Tell people the premises of, of what the show was about because yeah. I, I think it uh, – uh, and we'll talk more yeah, about wonderful. it, but it look, was such a, such a good show. Thanks so much. Look, Shand on Pictures, and, and it's back again on Stan. I sold it, yeah, yeah, I sold it to Stan. Um, you know, I was on Black Snow with Stan yeah. um, uh, this year. So those of you that want to watch um, uh, Black Snow, an Another extraordinary, good show. extraordinary show, um, and really shining a light on the South Sea Island story. Yeah. Um, we got the wonderful um, uh, Travis. Uh, Fimmel to yep. come and play the lead in that and surrounded by extraordinary, extraordinary performances. Um, so that was on Stan and through that conversation, I got Shand on pitches uh, back, back on. on Stan and it had just come off its contract over at the ABC and, and we got it back there. So Shand on pitches are fun. It's a crazy half hour comedy for those of you that haven't seen it. And it revolves around a guy called Tom Shandon, who's got his own video production company and effectively he makes wedding videos for people. But he, he truly believes he's the next great documentary maker and every single person he comes into contact with might be the food for the next great documentary. And at the heart of that show is a beautiful line from Cameron Bruce who wrote the opening lyrics for the opening song, which is, I just, he says, in the end, I'll say that I'm happy but I just want to do something great while I'm alive. <laughs> and I think that's such a beautiful thing because it operates in that strange space where as teenagers, we build an idea of what we want our life to be. Mm. We build a trajectory, an imagined trajectory of what that life like, And then we spend the rest of our lives reaching for the thing that the 15 year old got but there's always going to be a gap. And so much of life is such sweet sadness because few can realise the hopes of that 15-year-old child. Mm. Remembering, of course, that the 15-year-old that built the dreams of what they want the life to be didn't understand the power of loyalty, didn't understand the power of turning up on time, the power of just getting through the mundane and the day-to-day. -day. They didn't understand that strength that comes from being constant. Mm. When you're building your dreams as a 15 year old, it's this and fame and flies and people see me or I'll get flashy. You don't understand the true real stuff. And so Shandon Pitches to me was an exploration of that it was super funny because this guy was constantly seeing everything around him that he wanted to make great and I, make like, excited. And, and uh, I think and, uh, it was a long time since I've seen it, but like he's hired to video a wedding yeah but mm. there could be a story in this wedding <laughs> <He treats laughs> that's it, right well that particular one i mean there was a story in it because he the, treats it like a documentary well friend. the couple that were getting married were cousins so he had a <laughs> point he, he did have a point to say that there might be a documentary but, rather a wedding video at the greyhound industry there was a, yeah, yeah we took apart the greyhound industry and we had a good close look at that there were you know there were well i tell you one of the fun ones yeah. um was called uh, and the amazing Angus Sampson played um, the 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 Reverend Bevan. Now he was he played the Reverend at the cousin's um, oh, wedding, right. yeah. and then we brought him back because he was starting his own new church, <laughs> and so we and, and he was calling it One God. He was like, why can't all the religions of the world just get together? And at the time, we were taking off the One Tell branding, which was you know the failed telco, yeah. the Jamie Packer, Lachlan Murdoch failed thing. So this comedy allowed me to take all of these things that I'd seen in the world. But place it in the heart of a 35-year-old man boy that wanted to do something great while he was alive but didn't, couldn't quite get that the beauty was all around him yeah. and the kindness was all around him. And that's why I found it fun. I, uh, what, what I found, find, what I enjoyed about it, it's a show that every character in there had a flaw. Yep. Some, some, <laughs> uh, you know, there was some terrible flaws. Yeah. But you could still like them. Yeah. And it, it, it sort of allowed you to laugh at yourself and, and own all the mistakes we make in life. But look, everyone's just trying to make their make their mark in life in whatever way. Absolutely. And it, it really came, came across in the show. So it's back on stand. I'll, uh, I'll definitely... Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Check it out. And again, that that's really... Because it's interesting. Sometimes if I talk about the way I live my life and view the world, yeah. it's, it, it can feel to an outsider's ear that I'm judging the behaviour. I see that and I go, oh, that's a weakness. I just got out of the car and I had a chat um, with, with a mate and he felt that I was being harsh about someone. 
Yeah. And in that moment where you're discussing that flaw, then yeah, it sounds horrible and judgmental. But my hope then is that you can then take that flaw and place it within the larger ecosystem of that person's life or experience. Yeah. Still love that person deeply while there are things about them that you think can yeah. be done better. And that's what storytelling is about. It can take all of these things, the good and the bad, mm. and it doesn't make a judgment call on either of them. It just holds them in a story ready to be available as we move through time to constantly check back to say, are we getting better or worse at what we're doing? Yeah. So the whole idea of looking at all of these things and these behaviors and these funny little things to prop ourselves up or to dodge responsibility isn't to go the world's this or the world's that. It's like, oh, fuck. Look at how crazy the world is and there's good and bad in all of us. And, and bringing back to what we talked about in the first part, and I think it was a, a, something, a trait learnt from your father to address the issues if there's it, it, and it can be addressed in a nice way. I found that, and this is a skill I wish I had more of. Like I know my life has been, there's been conflict because I've let things build up to the point where, okay, yeah. well, it's it's on. And I see you address things. Like you, you'll call me out if there's something, no, that's not quite right. Mm. But you do it in a way that's not confrontational and you go, okay, I, I accept that and, and take, take it on board. I saw during the live show, yeah. I, I'd seen a, a softer side of Rob. And I'm not softer, soft's probably the wrong word. A more just laid back, chilled, yeah, we'll have a laugh, we'll do this, do that. On show day, like, no, we need the chair there. We need the light there. And to the point that you were very pedantic about the way the stage was set up, all of which you were 100% right on. And the way that you um, made sure that message got across, but no one took offense to it. Mm. I think if I tried to deliver that message, it would mm. come across, I'd deliver it maybe the wrong tone, the wrong at the wrong time, but you managed to do that without pissing people off. So Yeah, but I mean, that was... That's something I've had to work on, mate. <laughs> let's, let's, let's just say that. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's a, there's a thousand, you know, everyone gets to the end of every day and thinks, oh, shit, I made a bit of a pillock of myself Well, well you, you, ac you actually asked me, uh, uh, one one of the shows we're doing, have I gone too far this time? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I forget what it was over, but there was something that you dug your heels in on. Yeah, just, just, just constantly trying yeah. to check in, mate, because, yeah, I mean, I'm a big, I, 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 I take up a lot of space, yeah. so I've got to be careful. But I, look, I, I get that and respect that in that is your world, the world that we're going in there. If I, and, and people might misread me when I was in the police world mm. because I know what's needed here. We need to do this. Mm. And mm. how do I know that? I've been doing it for 20 years. Yeah. Trust me, we need to do this. We haven't got time to explain why that needs to be done mm. at this time. Mm. And you're the same way, like in your industry, like experience, experience counts. Mm. Mm. But again, yeah, it's, yeah, there's, yeah, well, well, everyone looks We know you're yeah. not perfect, Robin. Yeah. There's a plenty of things I could talk about. But, yeah. I don't want to go to court again. I don't want to be sued. I've had my time in court. Uh, oh my God, hang on. Sorry, just a story just popped into my head. Yeah. <laughs> and I've got to bring it up. This is out of nowhere and yeah. apropos of nothing. Okay. We're all right. Okay. But, Have we got the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ready? But this is the bit where it's, we're not all perfect. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it's about you. Where do Dude. you start? So now this is the one I love. So this is so, you think of Gary sort of, you know, arriving, being a bit of an alpha. This is going on. I've got this covered. You two over there. That's, you know, mark down the perimeter. See you at the station. We'll give you the, right? Yeah. So listener, humble listener, have a listen to this. Jubes gets out of the force and I think he's got his first major Zoom meeting. Oh, with his new employer, there, I think. It was with News Corp. And he thought it was just a bit of a Zoom chat with one or two others. Um, but it turned out he was on a Zoom meeting with like a hundred people. Conference call. It was a conference I don't call. Know. Was that in those in those days of Zoom where you've got like a whole raft of faces all over there? We're all but, learning our way in the conference call. So Gary's got this conference call, but he wasn't quite sure of how it was working. He was in his car. So he thought he was just going to dial in, but then he realised that there was a camera on him. Gary, take it over. No, well, I, no, I don't. But the, I told you this in the privacy of our own car, <laughs> Come driving on, mate. around the country. I but know it is pretty funny, but by God, it's embarrassing. Okay, so 
It was, a, a, as you described it, not long out of the cops. My reputation's tarnished. I'm starting a new career. Okay, I'm going to make an impression. There's a Zoom call. You know, in the cops, people would tell me, oh, boss, the Zoom call's on, and I'd walk yeah. into a room and, and yeah. start talking. Well, you famously couldn't even record your own f illegal phone conversations. Yeah, you had to ask your 2IC, <laughs> how do I record on this iPhone? I know. So we go in knowing okay. that your skills Te aren't great. Technical, I'm not, I'm not great. So I'm driving along. And the Zoom call, I think, oh, shit, okay, I better make an appearance. It's, you know, my new uh, new employer. And dial in. I'm, I'm concentrating on driving. <laughs> so I'm dial, <laughs> dialing in. And then I hear uh, Mick Carroll, who's the uh, editor at the Sunday Telegraph, the boss I, I'm reporting to. Hey, Gary, are you driving while you're on, uh, uh, on your phone? I'm going, uh, no, sort of thing. And... It was obvious that I was because I'm turning the corner, the indicator's yeah, yeah. on or whatever. <laughs> and I did not know what to hit on my phone. Like, it called me stupid. What, well, to it, stop it? To stop it. Yeah. To I, I just wanted, if I had my gun, I would have shot the phone. <laughs> just to, to, that's how desperate I was. So Okay, wait for I, it, viewer. And, uh, Check out how he solves this problem. Sometimes, sometimes you've got to think outside the square. So I don't know how to stop the phone. But I've seen time and time again on Zoom calls where it just pauses and nothing's happening. So people just lose interest and, oh, it's obviously dropped out and the image is left. There. The freeze, yeah, the frozen Fro frame. Froze. Mm. So I pulled over the side of the road and thought, I'll just freeze. <laughs> I thought the meeting would be short. And I sat there and it was too late now. I couldn't now because everyone's probably looking at me. So I thought, I'll just play that I'm freezing. He literally <laughs> sat. How long were you in there for? I think about 10 to 15 minutes. Right. It, hot day. Get hot. So Gary is sitting there in a thing pretending to be a frozen frame on his thing, except then the sweat starts <laughs> pouring down his bald little eggy head. <laughs> <laughs> And dripping down his bald. His, his little, I mean, it was, I mean, the, the first hair it came to was his eye, eyebrows. All right, Rob. Okay. Cut, cut, delete. It was a stupid plan. I, I know. love it. I love that there's this proper adult human being that's faced so many life threatening situations, frightened. <laughs> frightened, frightened of getting called out by his new colleagues for not knowing how to turn his phone off. Well, so you sit there pretending you're part of a freeze frame while sweating in a And it's not, it's not easy. Like, it's not easy. So you, you're not taking deep breaths. You're just taking shallow breaths. You're not moving. <laughs> I know. But I, I love that. I love that you put that under the heading of think outside the box as <laughs> yeah. opposed to under the heading... Desperate fucking panic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to dress it up just to deal with it. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry that was the other day, but I, I did think about that on the way here. Yeah, and I told you that in private, Rob, and this has been recorded. I know. Thank you very no, much. Not at all. Hey, your your family. I love mm. you. Love your family, mm. and your sons are just starting out in the manhood. Yeah. But there was a couple of years ago, and mm. it might have been, time goes quick. Yeah. We're yeah. having a conversation where yeah. you went away That's with right. your sons yeah. and. I, it sort of blew me away what what the purpose of going away of your sons was mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. what that was about. Do you want to talk us through that? Yeah, no worries at all. So um, my sons and I went on a Rites of Passage camp um, uh, at the Rites of Passage Institute. It was a making of men camp. Now, I think we can all agree that in the modern world, these notion of Rites of Passage have largely been uh, lost mm. uh, through the sands of time. And I don't know about you, Gary, but I... I didn't, I didn't make a conscious adult decision about the man I wanted to be until I was about 25 years old. Yeah. Right. I sort of woke up at 25 and realized I was a, basically a bag of broken habits masquerading as a character. I think I was 45. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or still learning. That's it. Yeah. So at 25, I suddenly went, whoa. Anyway, my brother-in-law, whom I admire enormously, um, and his wife, my sister, uh, and their two beautiful sons, Ned and Angus, a bit older than my boys, had gone through uh, a making of men camp. Mm. Um, I think their particular one was called Pathways. I went up to a thing called the Rites of Passage, the Making of Men Camp, put together by Dr. Anna Rubenstein, who is a world-renowned uh, psychologist and looked at, at, at young men. Mm. And it, he was very worried because he would meet all these beautiful, bright, young 
uh, 10, 11 year old boys through his practice. And then he'd meet a whole lot of disconnected, m morose 18, 19 year old boys. And he's like, wow, there's something going on. So here's what happens. Now I went up it's separately. Right, so it's, how old were you? The boys were. The twins, were how the, old were they? They were fourteen. Yep. Um, uh, do I say this? Yeah, I say this. Um, if you can't come, you can't come. Yeah. It's it's about your physical. It's about puberty. It's mm. about being old enough to become a man. All oh, right. Okay. So it's yep. that fourteen to eighteen yep. year old thing. Um, I went up uh, on different camps because it really is so focused on that one on one piece. Mm. You arrive, uh, the structure of the um, event is, uh, it's four nights, five days. Um, each boy goes up with uh, uh, the significant male in their life, whether it's a father, uncle, family, friend. Um, and this isn't a camp where you're doing manly things of abseiling and hiking and building and, and doing all of this. This is a camp where you go up and you're talking about the big issues. Um, for example, when you first arrive, you sort of meet a number of the young, other young boys. People are nervous, mate. Now, I was lucky because we'd gone in with, um, uh, my boys were excited about the idea mm. because they'd spoken to their nephews. A lot of other kids get sent, a lot of other men, and because their wives have said, yeah, you guys, something needs to change. Mm. Some other kids, it's the last chance to learn. What are we doing? But the idea is over the course of those four to five days, those boys go from being a boy to a man. And when you arrive on that hill, the first thing you do, you go into a TP. And basically I look at the camp as, it's not all those adventure things. It's TPs, fire, talking sticks and tears. Mm. And the first thing that you do is you go and you sit down and all the young, all the boys are in the inner circle. The, the men are at the outside. You're in a TP, the fire is lit. And the, um, the people that are running the camp, the extraordinary facilitators that Arna Rubenstein has up there, they ask this question. Men, could you please share with us the story of what your relationship was like with your father when you were the boy's age now? Who wants to go first? And you take that stick. You can imagine, can't you? 21 men, mm. 21 stories of what their relationship was like with their father. Well, the tears come very, very quickly. And there's some beautiful stories. There's some stories of uh, wonder and joy. There's stories of desperate sadness, desperate loneliness. There's violence. But at the end of that first round of conversations, all these young men have heard 21 stories, 21 different sorts of relationships that there might be. So first of all, they're like, oh, wow, this thing that I've got with my dad is just what I've got with my dad. There are a thousand other ways of being. So they start hearing them. Then after they've heard these stories, the facilitators say, boys, you've just heard 21 stories about different ways of father-son relationships. Tell us now, if you were to grow up and chose to have children or found yourself with children and you found yourself on a camp like this, what would you like your son to say about the relationship he has with you? confronting isn't it and so then all the boys that's a great challenge now the obvious part of that is they get to answer and the father gets to hear what the son thinks is important i want my son to say this about my relationship with him it's a great way of them speaking on by by proxy on behalf of themselves to their dad mm. you know? so it's a very cunning facilitator's technique but i think that the the, the kick in the tail is longer it asks those young boys in that tent, imagine the father you're going to be. I did not think about that until I was 25. Yeah. And yet on this particular week away, these boys start now seeing themselves in a continuum, in a timeline. I am this and I'm going to become this. And we spoke about this earlier in the conversation, this notion of whenever I view a character in a moment, I think of the moments leading up to that and the moments leading after it. But I didn't do that in my own life until I was 25. Make an active decision about the yeah. man I wanted to be. So this whole week then goes, it continues, it continues. And then you go, uh, relationships with mothers, you've got death, grief, challenges, all of these things, con conversing. And it all leads into this extraordinary evening 
where you send the boys up the mountain with the facilitators and they go away. And I don't know what happens up on that hill and that's not for me to say. Mm. That's men, boy to man business and they can tell you if they want. Yeah. But they spend the night out. Now, while they're doing that, all the men are back here. And then when those boys come back down off that mountain and whatever they've done up there, whatever commitment they've made to themselves or the group is with them. But they come down off that mountain and those boys, they are walking one foot taller than they did. So now here's the, the next and most extraordinary bit, which I'd love to communicate to the listeners mm -hmm. because it was a profoundly moving moment for us all. They come down off that hill. And while they've been gone, the men have been thinking about these boys that have gone. And so we've, and there's a, a great big open round area with big logs around a big, beautiful Game of Thrones type chair carved out of the stone. We've decorated it with all the native bushland and we've made a big arch for these young boys to walk back through and they come back. And then we have what's called an honouring ceremony and we sit around and at the right moment, you are asked to stand up in front of of all these other men and you're standing there and you're looking into your boy's eyes and you tell them why you love them. You tell them why you're proud. You don't tell them that you're proud of what they're going to be or what they have been. You stand there and you honour that young man for what they are right there and right then and you are witnessed by all of the others. And each of these young boys that came along to this uh, camp so often at the beginning, they wouldn't look you in the eyes. There was a lot of doubt. There was this. But for each and every one of those things, after those four days of intense conversations and, and sharing each other's stories and the power of story and the power of vulnerability and the power of men, the power of men discussing their own vulnerabilities and weaknesses in front of these boys, they would stare there and they, they stare at their father or their significant man and they drink that up. And they just listen. And the opportunity to stand and look in my boy's eyes. Now, I loved my dad and I got in with him very well, but we never had this moment together. Mm. And I was able to stand there and say that to my boys. It was the most extraordinary camp. Mm. Um, now, obviously, we then go away from that camp um, and you go back to your daily lives and then you've got to keep repracticing that. So it wasn't a panacea. It wasn't a fix-all for every person there. But I can tell you, Gary, it profoundly affected the relationship I had with my sons. They honour the feminine in a wonderful way. And they're very careful with the mothers and the significant women in these boys' lives in the lead up to the camp and in the reintegration after the camp. Because our young men have a very special relationship with their mum growing up. Mm. But a boy-to-mother relationship is different to a, a, a man-to-mother relationship. And these boys, they need to be you know, helped away from their mum's apron, you know, because that protective coerce, that sort of protective yeah. thing isn't helpful. So it, 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 it was a profoundly wonderful moment. And if, if people are struggling to connect to their sons or feel like I did, I wasn't struggling to connect to my son, but I know I'm a lot. And I know I wanted to broaden the conversation inside mm. my boys' heads with the amount of input they got. The things I worry about might not be the same things my boys worry about, but if I get together with 20 other men and they share what they're worried about, there's a good chance they'll yeah. hear something from another man. So again, it comes to that thing of triangulating um, the conversation around growth and emotional growth and yeah. emotional change. And, and Gary, I think that's what your podcast is really terrific for, is being able to have so many different conversations with so many character types, people that have not grown up with the blessed upbringing yeah. I have but they can share their vulnerabilities. I've, I've been so moved by some of your guests that have done horrible things. Yeah. That if you were to put a line in the sand that day, you would write that person off. Hmm. But they've rebuilt their lives and now they can offer that insights to young kids that might make the same mistakes. I think mistakes. part of what you, you're saying there and how powerful it was, and I remember when you were telling me about it the first time and it had the same profound effect on you as you're relaying it now. But what interests me about it was, yeah, how many lives go off track because they haven't got that? If ever there's a time where we need that type of thing, that that growing from the boy to the man with the respect for the feminine side, the relationship with the father and the honesty, I, I just it just sort of blew me away. I think it's so so important, and it's a lot of what we do here on I Catch Killers, as, as you just raised, looking at okay, how how can we? I, I've, I've said it on the show. I've said it to you. I, I leave the cops. I can't fight crime now, you know, locking, locking people up. But I think we can make a difference by steering people in the right uh, right uh, path. 
So Yeah, man, we're just creating an environment where stories are allowed to be spoken hmm. and people can hear them and then contemplate them on their way home or as they're going to sleep and start reflecting and thinking, okay, I'm not alone here. Yeah. And this is where, I mean, I'm a great, as you know, um, I'm passionate about my literature. Yep. And I read all, read widely. And there's a reason I love going back to my classics. And I've... I catch killers. That's right. And I read badness. it over and over again. I, <laughs> obviously, I did the audio book uh, uh, <laughs> and now yeah. I can just listen to myself do it. For, for a narcissist, it's... Well, there, there was one weird time, I, I think we were speaking, and I said, I've just gone to bed listening to you, my mate, read a book about me. <laughs> Cause written Rob by did, you. Written by you. <laughs> <laughs> and it, just, it felt uncomfortable for so many different uh, Mate, reasons. it felt uncomfortable, you're telling me. I did. I didn't... I, I didn't. I didn't take it on board. It was a horrible idea. To, well, it was kind of. It was. I, I was <laughs> at one stage when I was pissing you off about something. You were going to do the audio book with an Irish accent. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But yeah. it was that thing. So listening to these stories, and the reason I love my yeah. literature. So I've just been revisiting some Russian classics. Yeah. For example, and the reason I love that stuff is because I go, wow. I'm reading a book written by Leo Tolstoy uh, in the 1800s, and. Um, He's a guy from Russia, a couple of hundred years before me, and um, everything these people are going through are the same crises that I've got going. Yeah. So what it allows me to do is go, oh wow, this thing I'm, that's making me feel upset and worried and desperately sad isn't personal to me, because the same thing was being felt by a Russian two hundred years ago. That puts it in perspective. Doesn't well, it? it means that you go, oh wow. So this isn't a Rob Carlton crisis. This is just what it is to be a human being. Mm. This is a species experience, not a Rob Carlton fuck up. Now I'm the one feeling it, so I've got to navigate it, yeah. but there's something desperately calming about knowing that some poor Russian bastard's <laughs> been feeling this in the drawing room of fucking Moscow. Uh, and you know, and I'm feeling it like while I'm wandering it down King Street in the town. <laughs> Yeah, well, hey, Rob, you, you've mentioned uh, storytelling, and I, you know, if people ask me to describe describe you if I'm, I'm talking about you, and you know, you're an actor, you're a writer, this and that, but foremost, you are a storyteller. I, I, you're, you're a classic storyteller, and you've, you've got a show, or you, you had a show, and I think it's coming up again. I hope. Yeah, that's was. right. Yeah, yeah, my show. It's called Willing Participant. <laughs> there was. There's not many people I know that can put one chair on a stage yeah. and enter, entertain a whole theatre for a couple of hours just telling uh. stories. And uh, you you have uh, have done that, and it, it's fascinating. And you're inside into life, and you. I think what I like about you, and I don't want this to, you know, your enthusiasm yeah. for life. Yeah. Like you enjoy life. Yeah. You live it. You're draining, and I, I know your your lovely wife has a couple of times looked at me when you're going away when we're touring, and I was, could almost see relief on her face. Oh, oh she's kind you, in a funny way. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> kind but funny. I love him. I'll miss him, but you can take him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can be a lot. But, um, oh, I, so your show is it is it coming up? Yeah, like, that's right. So well, you've seen you came and saw my uh, show, yeah, and you travelled up to a Vocal Beach Theatre to see it. it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the show, I love doing it. It's four true stories. So, again, it's that, uh, it's not stand up comedy. Um, I tell four stories. And we've heard some shocking stuff on I Catch Killers, but if you hear some of these stories, you'll be going, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some wrong <laughs> business about them. But again, I think they're infused with love. I, I like to think, so the, the, the tagline it is, is four stories, every emotion. Yeah. Um, and I like to think people leave the theatre just a little bit more in love with life yeah. again uh, and because the stories I tell, uh, they're all true. They're, yeah. they're four true stories. They all absolutely happened to me. Um, and, and I explore them with a sense of fun and joy. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, one of the stories, dude, I told a lie to a production company I was 25 and I was living in Los Angeles. Mm. A film was being made in, in Melbourne and one of the key heads of department role, continuity, which is the most sort of technically difficult and um, process-driven role on, on the set, they, that person had dropped out at the last minute. I lied and told them I was a continuity expert <laughs> and I flew from – and they, flew, they, were like, oh, they were desperate. And so they said, right, 
get on a plane and they flew me from Los Angeles to Melbourne and I had to learn an entire profession from a book <laughs> on the way there. 14 hours I had. So I got there and then I'm on a film set literally pretending to be a professional, surrounded by professionals. So that's one story. But it played out. It, the wheels fell off so extraordinary. I like to think Rob, not because I, of I, me. Rob, the... And don't uh, don't wreck the the end of the story, but the way you told that story and what happened to I I was just sitting in the theatre with my hands over my eyes, going no 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 tell me this. Hasn't That's happened. right, but it's so exciting and fun. And the reason I love that story yeah. is because that happened in my mid twenties. Yeah. For your mid twenties listeners, man, big love to you people out there. You're the forgotten soldiers of what it is to be confused. You know, everyone talks about eighteen and twenty one, and then your midlife crisis, man. I'm telling you, if you're in your mid twenties right now, go easy on yourself because it's a time of life where you just that's right. You make so many big life decisions in that that decade, Mate, don't you? But you know, fuck all. <laughs> you know, fuck all. It's your first intimations of mortality. It's the first time ever. Like you know, before twenty five, I thought a thousand bucks would get me to the end of the world all right and then all of a sudden you think christ life is long this is difficult so i tell all these different stories and there's some heartbreaking ones and some beautiful ones but everyone comes into that theater it's super relaxing it's joyous and yeah i'm on adelaide fringe festival february 16th 2024 we got uh, i mean canberra again for doing an encore show we sold out in canberra last time yeah. so we're going back there and there'll be other dates all around the uh, all around the country as we tour that show. well i yeah I, i'll I'll give it a plug unashamedly because it is funny. Thanks, and, and when I say funny, that's it, emotional. And, you know, like uh, when we prepared for our um, show, yeah, the fact we go for light to darkness, and yep. that was a big thing for both of us, wasn't it? We wanted to be able to laugh. We wanted to be able to, you know, cry. You, you get scared. Yep. You get elated. Yep. All the emotions that you go for. Yep. And your show does that, but at your own expense. Oh, dude. If, if people think I'm embarrassed about staring at the screen for 10 to 15 minutes while sweat's running down my head, yes, I am embarrassed. But some of Rob's stories, that pales into insignificance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a reasonably brutal self-assessment, that show. But yeah. if the audience come along, I, you know, just watch me... Um uh, yeah, no, uh, put myself through the grill. But again, with such joy and I offer it up. And, and, and you know, the great challenge for this this tour, Gary, has been able to, because, you know, whenever you do that performance, you know, there can be an element of anxiety. How will this go? And yeah. people know this, any kind of new job, any kind of challenge, mm. there's an element of nerves. And this time I've thought, you know what, I'm just going to wander around the country and have as much fun as I can. I love telling these stories. Yeah. I've discovered the audience love hearing them. Uh, and so there's been no anxiety on this one. I know my lines. I know how it works. I throw myself into it. If I fuck it up on the night, well, you were there the night I fucked it up and you'll have a fun time too. Yeah. So yeah. at this stage of my life, I think the whole thing, uh, my business plan is to meet as many interesting people and have as many interesting conversations in as many interesting places as possible. That's my only interest in the world these days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so my hope is to travel around the country, put on my show, meet a stack of people and we'll see what happens. Well, life's always exciting when you hang out with uh, Rob Carlton. So, Rob, thanks for coming on I Catch Killers. Uh, I didn't get a confession out of you. But, uh, <laughs> I, I, I could go down a, a path, but I won't. No. Out of respect yep. for your children, wife. Thanks. 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 Um, but, uh, yeah, all, all the best for the future and I'm sure we'll uh, we'll catch up and we'll be working on something together. Can't wait, Gary. And thanks for having me in and um, a big shout out to all the listeners that have um, been listening today. Thanks so much. Beautiful. Thanks, Rob. Cheers. As usual, I always have fun when I catch up with Rob Carlton. I consider myself lucky to call him a mate. He's got some fascinating stories. I like his take on life. And I hope people have listened to this podcast and enjoy it as much as I did. And there's some really interesting stuff that he gives.